Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Cheryl Stenstrom. Uh, you were just listening to Dr. Susan Allman. She and I co-chair the um, Library and Management uh, um, Advisory Committee, PAC, for the School of Information at San Jose State University. I see we're recording. Uh, Sue, let me know if there's any uh, technical issues I need to be aware of, but uh, otherwise we will get started just with a brief introduction to what we're doing here today. And then I um, I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Melissa Fraser Arnett today, who is our speaker. So very quickly, for those of you are, who are joining our series for the first time, uh, the School of Information's library, uh, Leadership and Management PAC uh, for some time now, over the past year or so, has talked a lot about uh, uh, how new um, MLIS holders are often reluctant or don't quite understand how, uh, how quickly they'll find themselves in management and leadership positions. And so we talked a bit about uh, the skills needed for that, what the, what the job looks like when you're in those positions, and how we could best get some of that messaging across to uh, students, potential students, and I, in some, even our uh, recent grads and other new grads uh, with the MLIS degree. So out of that, the four-part series of uh, guest speakers who are out in the field was born. Um, today, as I said, I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Melissa Fraser Arnott, who is uh, on the uh, Leadership and Management PAC. She very generously gives us her time and advice um, during those uh, 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 committee meetings and other working sessions that we have. Um, as well as she is a uh, fellow graduate of the Queensland University of uh, Technology's um, PhD program, which is uh, held in conjunction with the San Jose State University School of Information. So um, quickly be, though, before I give you a full introduction of uh, Dr. Uh, Fraser Arnott, I do want to say that um, Dr. Allman and I are very grateful to uh, Jill Cleese and Kim Doherty at the um, the university's career center who played a part in helping us develop this series, uh, coming up with some of the ways that we might best promote and uh, convey the skills that we're talking about, um, as well as the entire library and management pack. They've been um, instrumental in getting this going too. And of course, in particular, Dr. Fraser Arnott. And um, without further ado, I would like to uh, let you know a bit more about her uh, background. So, she has work experience in a wide variety of libraries. I've known Melissa for, um, oh gosh, must be uh, 10 years or so, and I have known her through a number of jobs, but I didn't really understand the extent of her experience, very broad. Uh, right now, she's the Chief of Integrated Library Services at the Library of Parliament in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, she has a team of 14 embedded librarians uh, who provide in-depth reference services to different parliamentarians within government. Uh, she's worked in other government departments. She's worked in uh, nonprofit organizations and uh, in public libraries as well, too, including um, the Oakville Public Library and Ottawa Public Library. Some of her other government experience includes the Office of the Privacy Commi Commissioner of Canada, the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, and the Center for International Governments and Innovation um, in Ottawa as well. She also has taught, uh, and I believe on a regular basis, at, in the Algonquin College Library Technician Program, uh, where she's taught management and reference uh, collection management, um, uh, technology training and instruction. And as I mentioned, she completed her PhD uh, through the San Jose Gateway PhD program, which is in partnership with the Queensland University of Technology and her uh, MLIS at Western Ontario um, University in London, Ontario, Canada. She has research interests in competencies, how fitting for us today, uh, professional identity and knowledge management. So without further ado, um, Melissa, I think I'd like to hand it over to you and we'll get started. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Stenstrom and, Doc and Dr. Allman for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's, I, I, it's always my pleasure to, to participate in SJSU events. I, I'm a proud alumnus myself, so I'm always happy to, to participate. Uh, and the timing for this presentation for me was, was wonderful. Um, I've just made a transition myself in my career. I spent eight years at the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada in a very small library. I, I, was, I was the head librarian there of a, a team with one person 
Um, and, you know, I was doing, like, like many people in small libraries, in small special libraries, I was doing a little bit of everything. Um, and then I moved into, um, from, from that would have been considered a, a supervisory level role. I moved into a middle management role with a team that was 14 when I started. It's grown to 17 people uh, in the past couple of months. Um, and so it's been a time where I've been reflecting on what leadership means to me, what management means, um, how roles change when, when you make those transitions. Because you'll, you'll find through your careers, and, and many of you have already probably experienced this, um, is that you have a major transition first when you first graduate and enter libraries. And you may be doing, and you know, whether you're working immediately in a supervisory role or you're working in, uh, in, in a frontline role without direct supervision. Uh, you have another transition when you move to middle management, and then there's another transition if you, if you move into senior management. We've heard some of the speakers in the series talk about that, that move into senior, that the senior executive roles. Um, so I'm sort of focusing on the move to the middle management role, which I think might be one that, that there might be some of you who are considering that right now. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give you a, kind of a, a general introduction of my understanding of leadership, responsibilities, focusing on competencies, how they can be, be developed, what they look like. I'm going to give you, uh, you know, an idea of my, my view of leadership, and then I'm going to open it up for your questions. So I'm doing this in a little bit of a different format than the other speakers. Uh, but uh, I, I welcome all the questions that you have. I'll, I'll give my presentation first. I'll, I'll try and be as brief as I can so that I have time for as many questions as, as you'd like to ask. Uh, so I wanted to start here with what, what I called my understanding of leadership, and I know this is a text-heavy slide. Uh, but I really wanted to, to kind of frame this presentation by stating that leadership is different for everyone. Uh, there's no one best way to be a leader. I'm not here to tell you that, you know, I'm, I'm the best leader out there. My leadership style is the best. You should, you should emulate the style if you want to succeed. Um, you know, because what will make you successful as a leader and a manager is following a style that fits you and following a, an approach to leadership that fits you and matches your values and matches the way that you feel comfortable working. Um, and that means, you know, sometimes you'll find that your, you know, your style is a great fit with where you are. Sometimes you'll find that your style is not a great fit with where, with where you are, but you need to learn that and know that. And you develop your style over time. It's not, you're not gonna wake up one day and be a fully fledged leader. Um, I, nobody is, uh, nobody's is completed their leadership journey. We're all in the process of, of, of learning and developing and growing. And it starts from the time you're very young. It starts with your, your early observations of leadership in the world around you. I know a lot of my values in leadership and a lot, of, a lot of the things that I do as a leader and a manager are based on things that I learned from, my, from watching my parents. My, my father was one of my first leadership coaches. Um, so this, I, everything that I'm presenting about responsibilities and competencies all grew out of my values, my observations, and then what I've, what I've learned. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide and start getting into those responsibilities. Uh, so when I was thinking about my role and, and what I do you know, every day, as this is the, the day in the life of a leader series, I thought, well, a lot of what I do, I can probably group into a couple of categories um, and describe how those work for you. Uh, because there's, you know, we, we hear a lot about kind of the glamorous aspects of leadership and some, you know, there are some very exciting, stimulating parts of leadership and there are also some routine parts of leadership and management that it's, it's good to remember because you, you might find that uh, you know, you might feel like, you know, some of the aspects of leadership are a little bit intimidating, but you might also discover that some of them you've already been doing throughout your career, throughout your learning, uh, throughout your, your, your studies, and you might actually already have a good foundation in some of these areas. So it's not a big leap to, to make it, to, to get the full skill set. Uh, so the first of these that I want to talk about is obtaining resources. When I look at my, my usual day uh, at work, getting resources, getting people what they need to get the job done, probably takes up most of my time. Um, and that could mean anything from making sure that you're fully staffed. Um, I mentioned my team has grown in the time that I started. I started in September. I had uh, one, one or two vacancies when I started. And then we had a bunch of people go on assignment and I had a retirement and we had, you know, all sorts of, you know, unexpected things. So suddenly I was very short staffed and I had to dedicate a lot of time to, to staffing. Um, it's making sure people have the physical equipment they need. You know, do they have the right ergonomic setup? Do they have the right software? Do they have the right hardware? Is everything working? Is, are things breaking down? 
Um, do they have procedures in place in order to be able to do what they need to do? There's a lot of things that people need on a day-to-day -day basis. And if they don't have that, that's your basic foundation. If they don't have what they need to do the job, they're not going to be able to do the job. So it's not glamorous, but as a leader, sometimes your job is to work with the different functions at your, at your office to figure out how you can get people what they need. Um, and the second most important aspect of the job is, is building relationships with people. That's building relationships with the members of your team, building relationships with the other managers in your, in your organization, building relationships with, um, with functional specialists, that could be HR, that could be finance, that could be material management. Uh, if you're in a public library, building relationships with, with any of the stakeholders and decision makers, your, your town councils, municipal councils, anyone who's on your library board within universities, you're looking at relationships with, with deans, with provosts, with you know, other university executives, with, and with your, li your library users. So you want to have relationships in place so that you know, you know people, you know what they want, you know how to help each other in, in order to achieve your mutual goals. Uh, the third leadership responsibility that I found is, is advocating on your, I, I'm calling it advocating for your team while supporting the organization. You'll find that there's a balancing act in, involved in leading and managing. Your team has certain needs, your team has certain constraints on what they can do, and the organization is, has goals and objectives. And your job is to support your organization's goals and objectives, but to do that while supporting your team. Uh, you don't want to take on so much work that your team is, you know, is, is overwhelmed and is stressed out and, and they're all getting sick and they're all, you know, banking lots of overtime and, and aren't happy. You need to know what your team's capable of. And it could be knowing where they can be, where they can stretch and learn and grow and take on new, on new tasks. But it's, you really have to know that balance and, and know that you're, you're working for the organization, but you're supporting your team. Um, assigning tasks and setting objectives. Uh, is another, you know, it's, it's another bread and butter activity of, of leadership where you, you know, you, you've got to know what needs to be done in order to meet your, your organization's objectives. You've got to know the right balance, too, in terms of, of how much guidance that you provide people. And this is going to vary from person to person. It's going to vary from task to task. And it is a challenge to learn how to assign tasks and set objectives properly. You're probably, you, you might have taken tasks on delegation. Delegation is one of the things that people find very challenging when they're first uh, becoming supervisors, first becoming leaders. Um, it's something that, that we all work, but we'll, we all work on and figuring out what to, what to task people with and how to help them to, to complete those tasks. And sometimes it's, it's not just delegating. It's also, you know, for, for tasks that are part of someone's regular routine, knowing when and where to provide advice and, and, and how much of that advice to provide. Um, I work with a, with a reference services team. Um, I've, done ref, I've done reference in the past. Reference fun is fun and exciting. And, and sometimes people come to me and they'll tell me about a reference question they're working on. And my first impulse will, will, will be to, to ask them which sources they've checked and give them advice on certain sources. But, but you've got to resist that because your team are, are competent. They're capable. If they want you to give them advice on, on how to do how to do this, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of the job and how to you know, develop a search strategy, they'll ask you. If they might just be there to share with you an interesting story or share a challenge. So understanding when to provide advice versus when to listen is, is something that I would put within this, uh, this bubble of, of assigning tasks and, and setting objectives. Um, and then finally, we get to sort of the, the big one that people think about when they're thinking about leadership, which is providing strategic direction and context. So this is where we get into the vision setting and, and you know, the, the strategic priority setting and, and, you know, aligning work with, with, with strategy. And it's, it's, it's one of the, it, it can be one of the most enjoyable parts of the job if you're, if you're someone who likes to think about the big picture. Um, it flows through all of your work, but it's not something that you tend to spend a lot of hours on every day. Um, so it's something just to think about that, that you have to have a, a, an awareness of your context within your organization, but also within sometimes the larger world of librarianship. Know what's coming, know what trends are emerging, know what technologies are, are potentially coming that could, that could impact your team. So that to me is, is sort of the, the, the big categories of, of the leadership responsibilities um, that I work on. My day-to-day, -day I spend, you know, I spend my day-to-day -day in a couple of these bubbles, but you always have to be, you can always find ways to build your skills in all of them and, and keep thinking about all of them as, as you go through. Uh, the next slide. Uh, in this one, I've looked at, well, we've talked about the, the responsibilities. So what are the competencies, the skills, the knowledge that you need to actually 
uh, and fulfill those those competencies. And for me, there were three areas, uh, you know, or, or or groupings of categories that you need in order to be a manager and a leader. The first of these is functional knowledge, and this is what you're gaining. This is what you gain in library school when you take management courses. This is what you gain on the job as you're learning to do different tasks. Uh, you're learning to you're learning about you know how to do the work. So this could be anything from you know learning how to budget, learning how to um, how to manage how to manage people, learning how to run a, a run an effective competition, write a, a good job poster for a new position, learning how to you know manage your time and you know organize tasks and prioritize. Uh, this is a range. You know some of these are hard skills, some of these are soft skills. Um, but there's a lot of great course offerings that can teach you uh, uh, bits of this. Um, SJSU has a lot of courses, the, the single credit management courses, which can give you some good insights into each of these different, you know, a lot of these different functional skills. The second is contextual knowledge. And this is going to vary um, in every role that you're in because it really depends on the organization you work with. You know, it's, it's, it's not enough just to know how you know, for example, budgeting works. You need to know how budgeting works in your library because budgeting works, you know, there are principles in place, but the specific nuts and bolts of who do I speak to, what kind of things are most likely to get to get approved, what, how do I frame my argument in order to get things approved, that's going to vary from context to context. So you want to really build that organizational awareness and you also want to start training the people that you work with to 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 give you you know to, to to look for that themselves and also to you know keep you in the loop to share information about that context so that your team is all you know sort sort of builds that organizational awareness with you and then the final bit is your self knowledge it's understanding how you work and how you like to how you how you like to lead and how you like to manage um, this means finding out what your strengths are what your weaknesses are. Um, you know, being willing to to you know, the, the other presenters in this series have have mentioned owning. You know, owning your strengths, owning your weaknesses, and that's very important. Um, you know, you need to know what works for you, what doesn't work for you, um, where you can grow, uh, and all of that will you know it, it impacts your it impacts your happiness on the job, and it impacts the happiness of the people that work with you. Because if you're miserable, if you're in a job that's a bad fit, if you find you're always, you know, trying to use competencies that are a stretch, you know, it, it's going to be tough and people are going to sense that, that difficulty. Now, if you, you can, you know, if you're facing your strengths and weaknesses and you're letting people know this is a growth area, I need help, I'm looking for mentorship, you'll often find there are people that will help you. But it's just, you know, developing that base of, of who you are, of knowing who you are and where you, where you stand, and where you need to grow. All right, so next slide. So when I'm thinking about the way I lead and what I do on the job, um, I have a list of questions that I try and ask myself. Um, and some of these are scary questions. And, and my, my objective is to be able to answer, to be able to answer the, if I can answer yes or if I can answer positively to these questions, but I feel like I'm doing a good job. And the first is, and you'll see they're related to my, to my values and to my response and my list of responsibilities. So my first question was, do people in the organization trust me? Uh, this is key to relationships. Have you built up credibility? Have you built up, you know, authority? Have you built up trust? You know, have you shown that you're someone who can get things done when people ask you to do it? Uh, if you don't have trust, then you're not going to have good relationships. Um, do my employees feel they can come with me to me with new ideas and initiatives? For me, I'm, I'm, I'm a very strong believer in collaboration and employee empowerment uh, and engagement. So I want to see people you know, starting ideas. I want people to feel like they can experiment. And if people are not, you know, coming to me with new ideas, I, I want to know if it's, you know, is it is it because they don't feel that they're able to, or, you know, is, is it an, an issue in our relationship? Is it, you know, a lack of, you know, is, is it something structural? Is it something that they maybe don't feel confident about themselves? So I want to see, I, you know, I, I try to create environments where people feel like they can, you know, take risks and, and introduce initiatives. The next one's probably the hardest. Do my employees feel like they can question or criticize my actions to me directly? Uh, and this is one that no, you know, nobody likes to be criticized. No one likes to hear they're wrong. But I would much rather, if, if my employees think that I'm wrong about something, I would much rather have them come to me directly and tell them that I'm tell me that I'm wrong 
than to hear through, through the grapevine that people don't think that I'm, that I'm on the right track. And if people think that I'm wrong, then it gives me a chance to reflect and, and, and you know, try and make better decisions if, I, if, I'm, if I'm not making good ones. I might not have all the, of all the facts. I might not be aware of certain historical elements of a situation. Um, so the more you know, open conversation I can have with my teams and with, you know, and with my, my peers and my supervisors, then the, the, better I can, the better I can work for the team, the better I can work for the organization, and the, and the more I can grow. Um, do my employees feel that they were heard and their opinions and needs were taken into account in decision-making processes? This for me, you know, as someone who believes in, in, kind of in, collaborative, in collaborative leading and, and creating a, a collaborative workplace, I, this, this is, is really related to that value. You're not going to make everyone happy uh, all the time with the decisions you make. It's, it's inevitable that there are going to be people who don't like, don't like what you've decided, but can they live with it? And part of whether they can live with it or not is if they feel that their objections have been heard. You might, you know, you might, you might not be able to to change what you're doing. You might not be able to to change a process. You might be ba you might be in a position where you're pushing through a, a, a change that was made at a much higher level, where where you know, and you may or may not agree with it. But do you feel that you had a chance to state your objections? That your objections were considered? That there was a that there was an adequate answer when your objections were raised? That's something that I would look at, and it's part of making your decisions um, defensible and justifiable. If you've thought about alternatives, if you've thought about the impacts, that to me is, is an important part of decision making for leadership. Um, my next question, again, for myself, relates to leadership to relationships. Did my actions help to build a relationship, or they, did they damage a relationship? I found early in my career, I was very, <laughs> I was very concerned with being right. You know. I came out of library school thinking, well, I've, I've got this degree. I'm, I'm now an expert in libraries and information management. And, and so when I'm you know, presenting a model of doing something, it's, you know, it's based on the evidence and it's based on all the best, best practice about you know, how metadata should look. So people should just accept that and, and move along with it. And you can imagine the reaction that that, that type of attitude had. And, sort of, and over time and, and working with projects, you, know, you, sort of, you realize that it's is it more important to be right, or is it more important that you've that you've got the pro that you've, you've achieved the project's objective, that you've got a team that functions? Um, and so you, you focus more on the relationship than winning the argument. I, my next question that I ask myself is: Do people feel that I respond to their requests and questions effectively and efficiently? Uh, one of the key roles in being a leader that I, I sort of I realized didn't put on my responsibilities chart, but one of your key roles is um, as an, an information conduit. You're you're bringing information to the team. You're taking information from the team and passing them on to your to your managers. So are you a are you a good information conduit or are you a bottleneck where information is is getting lost? Um, that affects trust. That affects ability to get things done. And that's sort of the, the second the question after that. Are, are you specifically thinking about it about information flows? And then finally, am I able to defend and justify my decisions? Have I looked at the evidence? Have I considered the team? Have I considered all the stakeholders? So these are questions that you're you're not going to ask yourself every you know you you can you're not going to get a chance to ask yourself every minute of every day. Um, but it's good to take time to reflect on these, um, especially if you're having if if you're having a time in your job where things are are tough. If you've made a transition to a new role, if you're working on a particularly difficult project, if you are, you know, you're thinking of transitioning to to a different role, you know, if you're preparing for the start of a project and you're figuring out how to put a plan together, uh, you know, you're not going to achieve all of these all the time. You know, you, we have we have bad days. You might you might get in an argument with an employee, but you always have a chance to rebuild the relationship later. You always have a second chance. To try and, and and work towards your your ideals, because we're all we're all growing and we're all learning, and we're all developing. All right, and next slide. So that was my that was my very my very quick view of my my view of leadership, um, and so now uh, I'm open to any questions that you have. Thank you very much for the um, 
overview and introduction, Melissa. I, just following on Melissa's lead, everyone, we're going to open the floor to um, questions from any of you or comments. You can put those in the chat um, or uh, raise your hand if you want to do that. We can get you to unmute your microphone. But in the meantime, while you're thinking about that, uh, Melissa, Sue and I have a couple of questions we'd like to ask you too. Um, I think maybe you've seen some of these before, but uh, one of the things that we hear from students a lot and the Career Centre has heard as well too is just around um, you know, the kind of fear of taking on a management role and a leadership role because of the human relations aspects involved. So what kind of supervisory experience did you have before you took on your first uh, management or leadership role? Let's see. I mean, I, before my first role, I think my previous role before this one, I, I did have a, a, a staff person. I did have one employee who worked for me. So I was in a supervisory role then. I had, I had unofficial supervision um, in roles before that. I'd supervised volunteers, I'd supervised students. Um, and so here's, you, you sort of learn that supervision, there's, there's two aspects for it. There's, there's formal supervision and then there's, there's sort of the informal relationship building. Um, in, when it comes to formal supervision, you're actually very strongly supported in, in most organizations. You have suites of HR, you have, you have, you have human resources department, you have suites of HR policies. Um, so I learned, you know, in going through, whenever I had to do anything on the job that involved like a formal aspect of supervision, like running a job competition or giving a, giving a, a performance evaluation, there were always things that I could model that work on. You know, I, I'd go speak to my managers and get advice from them. Um, I'd go speak to HR and they'd help me through the process. So I never had to do any of that alone. Uh, when it came to the sort of the, the unofficial, you know, the, the, the less documented aspects of, of you know, human resource uh, of, of supervising and, and human resource management. That's, that's your interpersonal skills. So, I mean, those are things that you learn through all your relationships with, relationships with people over time. You know what works, you know what doesn't. You learn your style of, you know, of, of relating to people. So, um, you, I start, you start learning that with, when you work with teams in school uh, and not just, not just in your master's program, but, but throughout your, your educational career. Uh, so I had so I had a fair bit of uh, of supervisory experience over the years, because I always found even from my my first role you're always you're always at least supervising a volunteer, so you're never working in isolation. You always have some people who are working for you. So right from the time you graduate, um, when I moved from managing one person to managing um, fourteen and then seventeen, it was I was a bit worried because it was it was a big leap. Um, but I found it's, you know, the, the principles are there. It's just, you know, the complexity comes from the fact that everyone, you're, 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 you're working with people and everyone's different. So you learn about, you build the relationships with people over time. And there's no, you know, there's no, there's no secret to it. There's no magic to it. It's not different in the work context than it is in other contexts of your life. It's something that, you know, you, you just, you, you apply a lot of what you learned elsewhere. That's so true, isn't it? That idea of transferable skills. And I know um, you are uh, well familiar with that idea of transferable skills. For those of you participating today, um, Melissa has written a wonderful article around transferable competencies uh, when we're looking at moving between library types or um, even to jobs that are uh, not, that are non-traditional. So uh, some of Melissa's work is around uh, librarians who have the skills and use the skills from your MLIS degree and work in other kinds of settings. And so she thinks and writes a lot about this idea of uh, transferable competencies. Um, and that leads me into my second question for you, Melissa. Um, so you, it's maybe timely. You just talked about how you uh, came, when you came into your current position uh, last fall, there was kind of a a bit of drama in terms of, you know, a few people left, people got seconded or whatever, you had to like rebuild your team and bring on quite a few people and you spent a lot of time uh, getting new members up and running on your team. And so for those of our participants who are in the program right now, what would you say to them as an employer and as someone who does some hiring, uh, when you're hiring people into those positions or any position or a leadership position, what do you think are the most important uh, skills or traits or qualities that you that stood out to you during that period of hiring or if you were to hire again what what do you think 
what advice would you give our students about things that they should try to convey um, when they're looking for jobs that involve uh, leadership? Uh, well, it's, it's those transferable competencies, right? Um, and it's a lot of softer skills that we look for. Um, so, for example, when we're hiring, we look at things that are related to emotional, emotional intelligence. Um, we look at your ability to listen, uh, to listen, you know, active listening is vital. Um, your ability to teach others. And I don't mean formal, having, you know, formal training and education, um, but your ability to listen to what people need, to adjust your communication style to, to match what people need, um, so that you're not talking down to people, but that you're also not using, you know, too much jargon and making things too complex for people to understand. Um, we look at, you know, time management is vital. Um, in, in my workplace, we are, um, we work for, uh, we're, we're at the Library of Parliament, so we serve parliamentarians, so uh, members of parliament and senators in Canada. So these are very, these are, these are very busy clients, they're very high profile clients, they have a lot of information requests, and they're all, you know, they're, they're all VIPs. Um, so when we get requests, we have we have you know, often very very quick turnaround time. We often have very high volumes of requests. We cannot keep people waiting when they say something's you know needed at a certain time. It's got to be there. Um, we can't you know so so we do need people who can who can juggle you know large amounts of work and that that organization time management. It's also communication with your team. Sometimes it's negotiation with clients. Sometimes it's we're learning to work with the team to be able to um, understand where you can get help. Um, you know, we don't want to see people try and be superheroes and take everything on alone. You need to be able to to talk to your colleagues and let them know when you need when you need help. And that's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of of you know really understanding yourself and what's needed and understanding what goes into the task. Um, writing and writing abilities are also very important. Um, in, because in our context, we we have most we we respond in writing. We provide written reference responses to people. So you need to be able to write very clearly. You need to be able to organize your thoughts. You need to be able to provide something in a, in a good, quick structure that someone could read very, you know, read and understand very quickly. Um, here in Canada, we we you know we're we're a, we're a, a bilingual country, so we actually do respond. My team responds in French and English uh, to to questions that come in. Um, but it's that that communication, that organization, um, that you know. Being able to, to, to speak with people and have good relationships with people, those are the things that we really look for uh, that, that make people stand out as being able to, to do the job. And I think that's not unique to our, to our setting. I think that those are skills that, that people look for no matter what type of library they're in. Um, thank you so much, Melissa. And I want to encourage people in the uh, audience to type in any question that you have. This is a, an opportunity for you to find out um, at any level about management or leadership. But Melissa, I have a question. Um, you had said at the very beginning that you observed your father um, and got some leadership training at a very early age. Are there other examples that you can think of uh, either people that you have worked for or observed who were either strong or weak leaders who have influenced your style? I think I mean, it's, I, I've learned from a lot of people uh, over the years. I, I think really you, every, you, you have, there are so many opportunities for learning and you want to try and take advantage of, of as many as you can. And I learned different things from different people. I think my um, I spent eight years at the, at the, uh, at the uh, Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, and my, my manager there was excellent because she gave me what I needed. Um, you know, I had a manager there who allowed me to experiment and redefine the, the boundaries of my job and, and try new things, and that's something that I appreciated so much, and I passed on to, and I tried to pass that on to the, to the people on my team. Um, I learned from, from the people that I, that I went to school with. Um, you know, I, like I, I, I really love uh, Dr. Stenstrom's work on uh, on influence. She's looked at at influence and really highlighted relationships, and that's a lesson that I've really pulled into um, a lot of the work that that I do. Because of you know, knowing that if you want to get things done for your library, you've got to build liking and relationships with with the people that you're trying to that you're trying to work with and that you're trying to influence that can have uh, an impact on your library's budget. Um, in terms of of 
you know, leadership that I've seen in the past that, that hasn't gone well. I, I've had some, I've had some less than stellar experiences in my career. I think we all do. I think we've all had jobs that weren't a good fit. Um, and I think one of the worst fits that I had was a case where my, my manager was actually very new to management as well. Um, and I think that, that, um, that, that, that med made her a little bit, um, a little bit more inclined to micromanagement, a little bit more inclined to um, having very harsh reactions to any mistakes that I made. Um, you know, I, as an employee, every employee makes mistakes, um, but how you react to that is really going to to set their tone in the job. I, I I made a mistake in that role, and I was punished for it for months. You know, because I my manager felt that any mistake that her team made reflected poorly on her, and and you know, at, they had to be discouraged from ever making mistakes again. Um, and so I'm, I'm not inclined to take that kind of a, an approach with, with people for me because I know, you know, I've, I've made mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Um, and I'd like, you know, and, and you move on. Uh, so in terms of other, you know, other influences, in addition to kind of watching what people do and, you know, reading, reading on management and studying management and, and leadership, there's also there's also a lot of popular culture that you can kind of look at and study, and this kind of started with with my father, who believed he was, you know, I, I, he he wanted to, I guess he he had intended for me to be a manager, so so uh, so I uh, so he, you know he he we'd watch movies and he'd say, well look at you know look at what the leader's doing in this, you know sometimes movies about um, you know military movies are actually a great a great place to start. Um, where you can see teams in action and sort of look at what styles you like in there, what's working, what's not working. So there's there's plenty of examples and, and models you can look at. Thank you. Um, there is a question in the chat. I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but I'll read it mm -hmm. out loud. Um, I am a strong introvert and just getting started in professional service leadership. What are some tips for introverts on leading? I am also pretty good at written communication, but struggle sometimes with verbal communication. How can I improve? Okay, I can relate to that. I'm I'm an introvert as well. Um, I'm for for those of you who are familiar with Myers Briggs, I, I'm an INTJ. Um, so I don't. I'm not a naturally gregarious person. I'm not the person who you know who comes into the room and you know and and you know socializes with everyone and can chat with everyone. And I but I've seen people like that. My mother is. Is, is one of those people who can go into a room and have a, you know, have a 30 minute conversation with, with everybody in there. Um, and it's a skill that, I, that I've admired, but I've, I've never had. And you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be that person. So I find some of the tips that are, are first off, you can, you can be a leader without being an extrovert. There are quite a few introverts who are leaders um, and strong leaders. It's sometimes me, you know, it, it, it part of it is, um, is, you can, you know, know that your strengths are going to be different than an extrovert and, and highlight the strengths that you do have. You might not be the one talking on the fly in the meeting, but that doesn't mean, or, you know, that doesn't mean that you're not coming up with good ideas. Um, you can encourage, you know, you can try and find platforms to share your, to share your thoughts in, in ways that, that work for you. You know, if you don't want to give an oral presentation, you can send your ideas in writing in some cases. Um, if you do want to improve, you know, work on your verbal communication, there are, you know, there are different courses and different activities you can do, you can undertake to do that. You know, I'd say practice with, with uh, presenting. Um, practice with small safe groups first. If you're in a small work team, uh, you know, ask if you can make, you know, maybe a presentation to your small work team on if you've gone on a training session. Give a, ask to give a, a summary of the, of the training session to the group just to get you started there. I mean, if you don't want to do it in the workplace, there are groups like um, Toastmasters where you can actually learn debating and public speaking. So there are ways that you can, that you can work on that. Um, I was actually involved in, in theater and in community theater when I, was in, when I was in high school. And I find that for me as an introvert, if I have a purpose for the conversation, right? Like if I have um, developed a speech, if I have a script that I'm working on, if I, if I know the objective of the interaction, that helps me to do well rather than, you know, than, than going and having to completely improvise on the spot. Thank you. Um, there's another question. Uh, have you had any issues with being a woman in leadership? That's an interesting question. Um, I think, and it's, it, it's one that I think every woman is going to, and being a woman is, is part of, is, you know, when you are a woman, it's part of who you are. Um, it, it is going to impact how people you know, react to you. Um, 
I had, you know, I, I probably had people react to me negatively in ways that I might may or may not have noticed. Um, I think for me, the bigger, I've had more issues with people thinking I was too young for leadership rather than have than having an issue with me being a woman in leadership. And it might be even because I'm I'm a woman that that youth becomes like a second, uh, you know, it becomes an, inter, an issue of intersectionality, and in that you know if I were a young man, I wouldn't be quite as much, you know, they might not have reacted as much as they would to me being a younger woman. Um, I find if you know, I always try and turn a disadvantage into an advantage uh, when I when I when I'm faced with people who I think are not giving me the same amount of respect that they, they would if I were in a different category, whether it's, you know, someone, if, whether I'm perceived as not being experienced enough or um, if, if people, you know, have issues with a woman in leadership. And sometimes I find that um, it, it helps you, you know, I'm trying to, you know, articulate this. And I think the best, the best example is um, when I was in university, um, I got involved in, in debate, model UN debate. And I remember I was in a session where I was, I was, it was a you know, historical debate and I was, I was the only woman in the room. All the other, all the other debaters were men. And, you know, I noticed that they wouldn't, they wouldn't um, be quite as, as harsh. Like, I think they, they, they didn't want to get into a fight with me because I was a woman. So they, they were kind of being, trying to be gentle on me. Well, I wasn't gentle on them. You know, I, I kind of turned it around and I ended up being one of the most, um, you know, one of the, I was one of the most talkative people in there. It was a historical debate on um, the Suez Canal crisis, and and I, I think I was I was representing Yugoslavia. So in a model UN debate, that would not have put me in a good position to to make any points. But because I was, you know, I, I did work extra. I think I probably worked extra hard because I was the only woman in the room, and, and I ended up, you know, winning a prize for for the debate. So it's you, I think we always have to. You know, we're never going to be in a situation where, 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 you know, aspects of ourselves are not going to either give us privilege or potentially take away from our privilege. But we have to be aware of how it's playing out. What are the dynamics in the room? And then what can we do about it? We can't influence how other people are going to, to see us. We can't, you know, we can certainly, we can raise awareness when we see, you know, aggressions, when we see microaggressions. We can raise awareness when we see that, that structures are set up in a way that, that disadvantage women. Um, and then we can try and, and do our best to overcome them, um, you know, it, because it is it is possible, um, you know, and, and there are ways to overcome it. I I think I also want to mention before I took this role, um, I saw the posting for this job right as I was coming back from maternity leave, and a part of me thought, well, should I should I go for it? I just I just you know I'm just coming back from a year of maternity leave. I have a baby at home. Can I take on? The challenge of you know of working a much more senior role and and having longer hours with a baby at home and and the answer was well yes I, I won the role um, I you know, I worked out with my with my husband you know different different ways of managing the house you know different ways of managing daycare pickup so it's you know there there are, there are some extra challenges but there are ways to overcome it uh, you can overcome it in your own actions you can overcome it by working with the people around you. Um, by working, you know, if you're, if you're lucky enough to have a supportive partner at home, by working with them. Um, there, I'd love to say, you know, no, there's no issues being a woman in leadership and it's all easy and it's all good. Everyone's experience is going to be different. Some people are going to have a harder time than others, but you're not alone. And there are ways to help that you can, you know, find help. There are, there are people you can talk to. And I would encourage you to do it. If, you, if you're in an organization where you really feel like women are disadvantaged, go and talk to other women in that organization. Um, because you might find that when when a couple of you are, are are working together to raise it, that it can you can have a bigger impact than you might initially think. I had one more question um, about attaining leadership skills, either through a mentor or through professional associations. Um, can you talk about either of those? And then I, before you do that, um, I'll say. Uh, remind people, please enter any questions you want in the chat. So on, on finding a mentor, I'm, I'm lucky in that I can talk about my own experience and also the experience of participants that I, that I interviewed when I did my thesis. Because um, a lot of the people I talked to did work with mentors. Um, I've had sort of 
I, I was I, I did participate in a formal mentorship program in a library association when I was a new librarian, and that was great. I met with I met with a senior librarian. We had we went for dinner. I got to ask questions. Um, I you know I've, I've tried to you know shadow people on the job. I've I've watched what my bosses do. Um, I've got to meet people in, in associations through you know not formal mentoring programs, but just you know, just participating in committees and watching what people do and learning from them. Um, learning in the in, you know, in the, the SJSU program, you get to meet people who have a lot of great different great experiences coming from different types of libraries. Um, so I, I got to benefit from that. Um, I think mentorship doesn't have to be you know, it doesn't have to be formal. It can be uh, it can be an informal. Um, it can be you know as simple as just going for coffee with someone asking and asking questions, and you'll find that within the library community, people are really, they're really open, they're really friendly, they're really willing to to stop and talk. So I would, uh, so I would just, I would just say if you, you know, reach out, reach out and, and ask someone, and I'm sure you'll find there's a lot of people out there who who will be happy to to answer. Thank you for that answer, Melissa. I've got a question for you. Um, just again, while everyone might be thinking about any of their last. Uh, uh, questions to put in the chat and um, get take advantage of you you and your time while you're here. But um, kind of a a big one for you personally. You know what drew you to leadership and why would why were you considering taking on these um, bigger and bigger challenges? What what was it about the work that um, felt that you want you you know made you want to apply and uh, become a leader within the sector? Hey, well, I think I'm. Um... For me, I, I I like to like I like to have an opinion and I like to be consulted. <laughs> like I want to have an impact on on what's happening in my world. I don't like to just sit back and let things happen to me or let let decisions be made without having a seat at the table. And you can't if you're not going to be a leader, you're you're not going to show leadership. Then you're not going to have a seat at the table and you're not going to have an imp impact on what happens. Um, now you don't necessarily have to move into management to to have a voice, but it you know it 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 does make things easier. All right, like there we're still there's still a lot of hierarchies in this world. Um, we're not in totally flat organizations. Uh, we may be moving towards you know flatter models, but if you want to really have a voice, you need to you need to be willing to to take the risk and and jump into positions of greater responsibility. So that's for me why why I did it. I'm I'm the kind of person that. Um, that just I, I can't sit back um, and let others make the decisions. I had to I had to have a seat. It's great. It sounds like a combination of um, you know you you were uh, brought up from an early age with that attitude, and also your the nature of your personality as well too. Um, we're going to put out another call for questions from the audience. Uh, uh, again, um, while we have Melissa on the line, I have a quick one for you. I don't know if you can answer this off the top of your head, Melissa. Um, one of the questions we've been asking some of our other participants is if there's anything that you've read lately or um, anything that stands out to you that you would recommend that people read on the topic of leadership and management. Okay, there's a couple. And so this is going to, you know, I'm, I'm curious what people think of this or if they've read it. but. But a book that I've read in the last couple of years that that really that really made me think and really kind of reflected on the values that I have is um, is how to win friends and influence people because it really focuses on having you know having relationships, listening to people, um, focusing on on you know having you know not just being after your own interests but but working to achieve mutual goals. So for me that that really spoke to to where I you know where the place that I lead from um, I've, I've read a lot of different management things over over the years you know there, there are a lot of the you know the, the category of management fables um, they're fun reads some of them stick with you more than others I think you know there, there are a couple of change management that are that are that are good fun and uh, you know and and are nice quick reads uh, I think one of the other presenters uh, talked about um, my eyes my iceberg is melting. Um, there's another one, how, you know, who moved my cheese? I think I actually found that one more fun, uh, which is it was also about um, change management and the need to, to constantly be kind of moving forward and thinking about new challenges and new strategies. Um, 
But I also would recommend the uh, Harvard Business Review is, is, is a big one. If you don't have time, because I know a lot of people are very busy and you don't necessarily have time to read, um, read a lot, um, I would say they, they do have a, um, uh, a subscription, a free subscription for the, the Harvest Business, Harvard Business Review um, like tip of the day, which is it's going to be, it's a paragraph of text. It gets sent to your inbox every day. Um, it's based on, you know, on research that, that's in the, the, the business review. So I'd say if you only have a couple of minutes a day and you want to get a good mix of different management advice, just uh, sign up for that. Those are all great titles, classic. Um, we have a question that I, I don't know if everyone saw this in the chat. I, I was scrolling by a little bit, but the question, Melissa, is what's the male-female balance at your workplace and do you have anything to share with us about managing uh, males and females? Okay, interesting. Now, I, I feel, you know, as, as a woman leader, I feel very privileged that I have often worked in workplaces with um, a lot of female managers and senior managers. Um, and part of that is, is, you know, because we're in libraries where, where women, women tend to, um, to dominate numerically. Um, in, at the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, um, for, we actually had a couple of commissioners during my tenure there. I was, I was there for eight years, but two of the three commissioners that I worked for were women. I remember sitting at, at the senior executive table at, at some meetings and, and seeing that women outnumbered men in the executive positions for a while there. And here at the Library of Parliament are um, the, the, the parliamentary librarian's a woman, the, assist, the, uh, the uh, assistant parliamentary librarian's a woman. So I've always had a lot of, uh, a lot of strong female uh, managers and senior managers to look up to. Um, in terms of staff, um, I've tended to have more uh, women than men work on my teams. Again, probably because in librarianship, we still tend to be about 80% female. Um, but I'd say that the difference that I found in managing people are, are less related to their, to, their, to their sex than it is to other aspects of their personality. Um, there's, I, I pay more attention to whether people are introverts or extroverts uh, than I do to their sex because that really affects how I plan meetings. Uh, my introverts hate it when I throw a new topic, or a new brainstorming topic, a discussion topic at them at the meeting without any advance warning. So. When I'm, when I'm actually planning strategies, I, I think about communication style. I think about um, those kind of preferences more than I do about, uh, about the sex. That's a great point. Um, uh, you know, it's often management so much more than just sort of um, those, those single traits. Even though gender can make a difference, there's that kind of whole package to everyone that you're supervising. Uh, any last questions from our crowd? And uh, let me extend that to Dr. Allman. Is there, do you have anything, any other questions you'd like to ask uh, before we wrap up? No, I think we're all set. And I just wanted to thank uh, Melissa so much for taking time to share her thoughts on leadership with us. It's been um, very enlightening. And thank you for all your suggestions. Well, thank you for having me. It's been my pleasure. Melissa, I'd like to thank you too. It's always um, a treat to uh, speak with you and hear you speak. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our participants as well for coming today. Uh, great turnout again. And um, as uh, for those of you who've been to our other two sessions, you know that this is being recorded. So the link gets posted on our website as soon as our technicians have a chance to get that all set up, um, usually within a few days. Um, and I would invite um, everybody to uh, come and join in on our last of the four-part series next week, same time, Friday um, at, uh, I believe, 10 a.m. Pacific. We're all in different time zones. So uh, for me, it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so check the time on our website, and we look forward to having you there. Otherwise, thank you again, Melissa. Wonderful um, discussion, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Everybody.